I'll so we have Dan you. in the house. Dan Winter. Um, Everybody. Dan, <laughs> can I? Do I? Do I have you here? I'm looking. There you are. There. Oh my gosh! I'm trying to use my computer on one side, my my cell phone over here. But Dan, you. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, but. Alan was telling me that you're the leading mind of new physics and that involves conscious new physics that involve consciousness and spirituality in a practical way. And when I was reading your biography, I was like, oh my gosh, he, this guy is multifaceted, multi-talented. Alan was saying that you are just like um, it, the, the genius in, in ascension. Um, when I when I read your bio and I see that you you graduated in psychophysiology and the origin of languages, that really got me. And then to also see that you have an academic background as a system analyst with IBM. And looking at all of this, you're industrial metallurgist and crystallographer and just seeing, did you really model at the MIT Space Lab to did you, you did that? Well, you know, I was living with a Gurdjieff community in Boston and uh, I was invited to, to use the computer plotter there. They were steering the first X-ray astronomy satellite at MIT, my friend, John Richardson. Yeah. So I did the first sacred geometry modeling at the computers at MIT. <laughs> that, that's so incredible. And then seeing all the different things you did with Buckminster Fuller and the Giza pyramids, Israel, the Andes, Findhorn, all these places I've been interested in, you know, all these, you can feel the energy just through your, um, through your bio, but one of the things that really got me is talking about you were dealing with heart math in the in the mid 90s, it looks like. And I've always had a feeling about being able to measure the effect of coherent, you know, the ordering of the heart harmonics during the feelings of compassion, because I feel like because I'm a feeler, I don't really think with my head. I was like, why do you have me introducing this genius when I'm not the girl that's in the head? I'm, I'm here in the heart. And everybody knows that it's, it's my heart that leads me and that I feel like that's the brain that I use. So knowing that you can scientifically point to that, that there is heart coherence and that you can measure it scientifically that really lights me up that you're you're proving something that I've been feeling all along, you know. So yeah, um, we, we had to foster foster Perry in the uh, Miller Filmer Hospital in Buffalo, and he was sending love, and we were measuring the power spectra, the frequencies of his EKG, and we got this dramatic cascade of coherence just when he said he's sending love to the kids, you know. <laughs> and okay. that's when I taught Heart Math Institute how to do that, basically. I I love knowing that because I met Howard many, many years ago. Yeah, and <laughs> I, I just really felt, you know, like this is something that's going to lead us into the new frontier is, and James Gilliland and I talked about that because I used to say to him, you know, like, I don't, I don't really understand all of, all about all of the physics and the geometry and all that, all of that, but I definitely can feel things in my heart. And James says, well, where we're going, that's the, that's the brain you want to be using is the heart yeah, your, brain. Your so. heart literally becomes a laser. That story is at realheartcoherence.com. And I was actually credited in the medical literature with inventing the word heart coherence because we developed a math that's called a septor, second order power spectra. So you actually your heart becomes a laser when you speak your passion. <laughs> I, I, I'm so glad I got to actually meet you and, and <laughs> dive in with you for, for a minute before you start your presentation. Alan wanted me to ask you about spiritual hygiene. Right. Well, you know, that is the conversation today is that, you know, the, the real lesson of the extraterrestrial history is a science lesson. And that lesson is about astral hygiene and how your plasma becomes literally on fire as in your heart. And when your heart is on fire, and there's also what we call flameinmind.com, that plasma fire's density is what sorts your aura and literally burns out the parasites, as it were. So the hygiene is a matter of getting density literally charge implosion in your aura, the quality of grace. And that's what we're talking about today, exactly. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm going to turn my camera off and have you take it away. And I'm going to sit here with the pen and take notes. 
<laughs> well, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here, everyone. Every, as you know, I'm Dan Winter, fractalfield.com, realheartcoherence.com. And we've been teaching the physics of consciousness for 30 years. You know, our YouTube channel has uh, 2 million views. And so um, what we're talking about today is, you know, what is a what is a real star being? And the concept of a star being actually is more accessible to science than you might think. You know, the solar flare output has been measured 11 times, affected when a million children sang the same song. The solar flares go, ah. <laughs> so the plasma of the sun is actually inhabitable. And in fact, um, every sort of major ancient religion on, the, on this planet essentially starts with the concept of a sun god religion. You know, like when Osiris was really anky, if he didn't inhabit the sun, the Nile wouldn't flood on time. Well, you know, people think that's a metaphor, but, <laughs> you know, I'm here as an electrical engineer to talk about the physics of how you inhabit a plasma cloud. You get centripetal, as in, you know, we've taught for many years how shaman would steer a tornado. Their aura literally embeds centripetally in the center of gravity of that tornado by empathy, by compassion, by feeling the pain of the tornado, eating the hucha. That's a story we've told many times. So if you understood how your aura can become centripetal enough to embed, nest, to become the center of gravity centripetally, and you could steer a tornado, we, we've always said, well, if you could steer one tornado, you could steer everything that is physics, because physics is made of nothing but tornadoes. I mean, string theory, wormhole, vortex. So effectively, if you could learn what made any vortex centripetal, then you could learn how to inhabit a plasma cloud, starting with a tornado and eventually a star. I mean, a sun. I mean, a star being. <laughs> so, so the idea is that... Um, the, the literal physics of what makes your plasma cloud, your aura, your ka, uh, your rainbow light body, whatever makes it centripetal is obviously the key. And the theme of this presentation is that, you know, you could spend many lifetimes studying ET history, and then you could study the ET personalities. But I have always strongly suggested that history is a nightmare you can wake up from when you learn the science lesson. <laughs> and ET history is no exception. And um, so I'm suggesting that the, the even the controversies about ET history ultimately are resolved in a science lesson. And that science lesson is really quite simple. Uh, the climax of that story is called fusion in the blood. And I have been assembling that extraterrestrial history information for many years under the uh, web article fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood for that reason, which is that the science lesson here is whatever made implosion in your blood, implosion in your heart, implosion in your brain waves, flameandmind.com, is what enables you to get centripetal in the plasma, in the aura, and inhabit the array. You see, so many people talk about, you know, what it is to be in the fourth and fifth dimensions, but very few scientists are even willing to listen to those conversations because oh, there's no physics. Oops. <laughs> but now we actually have the physics. The physics started with when we learned the physics of lucid dreaming, that uh, we have a plasma device called Therify.net in use in 25 countries doing rejuvenation. And that device creates what's called conjugation or implosion of plasma. It's like pine cones kissing noses and it becomes centripetal. And, and the uh, so you're lying between these plasma tubes. We'll show you a picture. And what we learned is that we were able to consistently trigger lucid dreaming. And we now know the physics of lucid dreaming and therefore the physics of where you go when you die, for example. You inhabit a larger array because when your aura becomes centripetal, it spits out a coherent field effect called incorrectly scalar. The correct term is longitudinal interferometry, longitudinal waves, which are compressional waves, not transverse, but compressional, longitudinal waves into an array 
sometimes called heaven or plains of Sharon or ancestral memory or Akashic records. We got too many names for the thing, but not enough physics. <laughs> but now that we have electrically determined what electric field triggers lucid dreaming and therefore how to take memory through death, we can talk very precisely about what it is to be in that quote unquote next dimension. Because what allows your aura to inhabit that bigger array, for example, the array of a star being, the array of a sun god, you get centripetal in one node of that array. And then the longitudinal or compressional waves propagate in a geometry that looks something like this. It's called the star mother kit, golden mean dot info slash kit. It's the only possible 3D fractal infinite dodeca ecosa stellation. It was called the greater maze in theosophy. So that only possible 3D fractal array, think uh, Jodie Foster's dodeca in contact, <laughs> where she lucid dreamed. <laughs> so inhabiting that array is a matter of getting centripetal enough and then coherent enough. And those compressional waves then bounce coherently only at the nodes of that array where the compressional inertia exchanges information energy with the transverse up and down components of that electromagnetic field, which don't go as far. So if you want to contain heat, for example, at a distance, the physics of action at a distance is this longitudinal array. The physics of what is a gravity wave is this longitudinal array, as Tom Bearden proved with equations in the book Gravitobiology. So we're learning something about inhabiting the array here. <laughs> and so I want to go back now and say that this is in fact the science lesson which res re resolves the, the whole history of the ET story and it resolves the conflict of personalities, for example. So my, my background in the ET history here I've been teaching physics of consciousness for 30 years, but I've been teaching extraterrestrial history for many years as well. I'm friends with Anton Parks, who really wrote, probably wrote the best history of Anki. And uh, recently, I'm grateful to have a good friendship with Elena Denon. And I've made about six videos about the physics of the extraterrestrial situation with her. And... Um, uh, and Michael Sala and I are starting some projects together. And I, I knew uh, Alex Collier years ago and even had some... Uh, telepathic communication with the Andromedans, Phaseus, actually, Phaseus and Mornay, the mystics of the Andromedans. And, you know, even uh, Rob Potter recently was the expert on the, the Venusian, very advanced civilization. Uh, he and I have in common being in Fred Bell's living room when he was communicating with Sam Jossi. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've been bouncing around these stories for many years. And <clears throat> point being that now, Michael Sala, Exopolitics, is repeatedly talking about what he calls the Star Trek future. And the Star Trek future concept is uh, linked to uh, Elena Danan's most recent book, The Cedars, in which she usefully describes, you know, uh, it's, it's not, um, <laughs> it, it, she usefully describes Enki doing a scene from the movies in which someone says, I'll be back. <laughs> it was not Schwarzenegger. No, it was Anki. <laughs> Anki came back. And uh, Anki Thoth and his team in the advanced called the Cedar Races. Now, <clears throat> an example of how we resolve a controversy here. So then when Elena Denon apparently met Anki, who was Osiris, I believe, literally the sun god story, uh, having, quote unquote, returned with the advanced cedar races, sometimes called the nine. And we have an excellent film out on the plasma physics of what is and who is the nine. Um, it, so, you know, a controversy started because one side says Anki's the good guy and one guy says Anki's the bad guy. And, you know, it's a matter of who won the public relation wars at the time. Anki's half-brother and Lil Yahweh was named Satam, S-A-T-A-M, meaning territorial administrator with the Anunnaki, which became our word Satan. And so when he was losing the public relations budget, he was the bad guy. And then Enki, for a while, he, one of his names apparently was Lucifer, and the eye of Lucifer is the Kaaba stone, which is the physics of 
the, the philosopher's stone and the projective powder and real alchemy. Uh, and so there's this whole controversy of who was the good guy and who was the bad guy. And frankly, that controversy is boring <laughs> because it's not about personalities. No, it's about pure principles. It's a science lesson. The science lesson has to do with, for example, we believe that actually um, uh, uh, Vampire Chronicles uh, said that the father of all vampires was E-N-K-I-L. And some people believe that Enlil, Yahweh, was apparently the largest plasma parasite in the solar system. And in fact, literally, who is called the Grim Reaper come to eat souls of death. And actually, it doesn't matter who was the good guy or the bad guy here. No, what matters is how the science of how you avoid becoming a plasma parasite. And it turns out that Enlil, in fact, had no source of bliss. And so, in fact, had to eat the aura of others. Now, this is a science lesson about how you avoid becoming a plasma parasite. And that's interesting. You know how it is said that some people, children often, if they're born in the country and spent their childhood in the woods, they learn to get their energy from the land. And they eventually have their own way of absorbing charge internally and eventually come to find their own source of bliss, literally. Whereas many children who are born in the city and live in electrosmog, they had no way of accreting charge, sometimes called the quality of grace or chi or baraka, from the land. And so they're relying on other people for this, their source of charge. Now, this is a problem because if you don't, evolve to have your own access to your own source of charge, literally implosion, the true physics of bliss, the flame in mind.com or the flame in your heart, the real physics of compassion, turning inside out recursively, as it were. If you can't evolve to have your own source of charge, the reason you are by definition a parasite is because you're actually not self-steering. What makes you self-steering is the ability to learn to accrete charge. Because when you can implode, you can embed in, for example, a tornado. So you see, the, the, the story of ET history and the story of the personalities of ET history will are only an introduction to the physics. The physics lesson is what makes you immortal. And that's what this presentation is about. So in summary, when your aura learns to implode and become dense, what you call a higher dimension is the increase in the number of frequency harmonics measured by the number of axes of charge spin superposition that are rotate, rotating superposed. The only definition of going to the next dimension, which is why when your brainwave harmonics get another harmonics, alpha, beta, and then gamma, <laughs> you inhabit a larger array the embedding is more complete, more fractal, more centripetal. That's why you call that the next density. The next density is the next longer wavelength superposed in the array, making the array more centripetal and more dense, and your aura potentially larger into a bigger array, literally ride the long wave, Uncle Joe. So, um, and this, this, is, <laughs> this is the heart of astral hygiene, where you're your day-to-day -day work is about learning to gather charge. Oh, you know, when was the last time this piece of broccoli felt genetic diversity? That's, you know, everything you eat is about, are you accreting charge? Every movement you make, every place you choose to sit in the room, the place of power is about accreting charge implosion. And that eventually becomes massively centripetal. And that's when your aura takes on what's called the Holy Grail. And that's what the the slide share is about. Let's see if I can find the uh, desktop one. Let's try this. Okay, share desktop. So I want to share a keynote here. Hopefully you're going to see my keynote. Are you seeing a little vortex? I hope. <laughs> so if you see this vortex, if you knew what makes that vortex centripetal implosive, you could know the answer to all the important questions like, 
what ghosts do after death, how tornadoes are steered, how plasma heals, the origin of angels, how you can go into a lucid dream, why ball lightning responds to telepathy, how your brainwave plasma tornado enables you to see without your eyes, how intent arises, the physics of the origin of the concept of God, how alchemy works, how implosion is the center of gravity of all mind. So you see, the key to all of that starts with knowing why anything is centripetal. The, the sadness of today's physics is since they don't know why an object falls to the ground, sadly, they don't know why anything is centripetal. Consciousness is centripetal. Life force is centripetal. And gravity is centripetal. But physics doesn't know why any of those exists at all. This is a problem. So once you know why anything is centripetal, you can start to answer all the important questions. And the reason this vortex becomes centripetal, if, if you were there when Victor Schauberger's water vortex started spontaneously getting colder, it's a piezoelectrically doped water vortex, and it made so much electricity from gravity that Hitler wrote him a check. That's implosion. Now, Jonathan Dolly at the Implosion Lab in UK spun the bottom of the piezo vortex at 50,000 RPM, and the vortex developed a blue aura and if anything that got near it would be sorted, for example, dirty water, that's implosion. The implosion exists in water or plasma or your brain or life, enabling anything to be negentropic, which means self-organizing, because of this golden ratio implosive called phase conjugate or fractality perfected cascade. That's what makes a pine cone alive because it's generating that voltage with those fractal capacitors called seeds. And this is the fundamental principle of implosion we've been teaching for years. So if you looked at the top-down view of DNA here on the bottom right, which is now I proved by equation, this is literally the top-down view of hydrogen, the center of water in every DNA ladder rung bond, you see the golden ratio enable, enables the waves of charge approaching center to add and multiply recursively, constructively, not just wavelength, but phase velocity. So when the phase velocities add and multiply implosively, this turns compression into acceleration towards center. That acceleration of charge towards center, possible only in a fractal geometry, hydrogen, for example, that acceleration of charge that's generated from only that fractal form of compression is named the gravity. It is also the cause of life, and it is the cause of embedding. It is the cause of the grail and the blood is the result of bliss. So that implosion is the solution to all these problems. Perfect damping, it's called phase conjugation. It's how you make self-awareness. It's how you make negentropy. So I wrote the equations here and I won't go into the physics in detail. It's all at, as you see, fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy and fractalfield.com slash conjugate gravity. But these are our published physics papers explaining why in physics, the golden ratio is the only possible solution to constructive wave interference and therefore is the solution to Einstein's question, which is infinite non-destructive compression is the solution to the unified field. Now we know what non-destructive compression, how it's perfected, because waves add and multiply recursively constructively only in golden ratio perfected fractality. And this is the published equation proving that is the geometry of hydrogen and how hydrogen vortex got. So if you looked at this vortex again, now you can know there's a stack of the array of those cones from the sh shape of hydrogen to the shape of the piezoelectric vortex in water that allowed that implosion to happen. That's how it got centripetal. It's the solution to every single spiritual problem in life is to learn how that got centripetal. So I took that equation and built the imploder.com, the imperfected vortex. And we do that also in a larger commercial version called, that's the super imploder here, the imploder.com. And uh, this is the ultra imploder. I did the CAD CAM equations to build this into technologies, which is also behind our flame in mind and therify.net. This is a this is an example of phase conjugate magnetics where we use those frequency harmonics. And actually these harmonics here proven to, to uh, relieve pain in uh, Elizabeth Rauscher's FDA trials, motorize the infrasound behind therify.net. And here's the picture. Here's the plasma tubes. We took a, the phase conjugate optics of the noble gas modulated half a million volts with RF 
sub megahertz, and then an infrasound cascade that looks like this. These are the infrasound low frequency harmonics here in pink. And we implode a very broad spectral pine cone. <laughs> now that might look familiar from the pyramid walls, <laughs> the logo of therify.net. And the symbol for that shape is called the caduceus. And the caduceus is the principal of the guy named Thoth Hermes, who is the hero of <laughs> the work we did with uh, Elena Denon and the returning nine. So actually Thoth Hermes Thothmosis was the name of the royal line of Egypt. And that, that caduceus looks like this. If you take my equation called origin of negentropy, Planck times powers of golden ratio, fractality perfected here in blue, you can barely see it. But, and that predicted the Schumann harmonics here and the brainwave harmonics of bliss and proved that that implosive cascade is the wave mechanics of perfect implosion. And so this, this implosion is generated when plasma or water or, or the, the vortex inside your head when you're about to see without your eyes or lucid dream, that there's a recursive turning inside out or implosion that generates self-organization and self-awareness in the center of the vortex. Like kids who are about to see without their eyes, they see a vortex form inside their head. And we measure the brain waves for how they do that at flameandmind.com. So this recursive turning inside out perfected actually is the origin of implosion and self-awareness. And if you make it map of the possible geometry of turning inside out perfected, you get the Anu, the name of the heart of the sun, and the heart of the human has that symmetry, and the heart of hydrogen has the same symmetry called Anu, seven spins outside, five spins inside. And that, those five spins are actually dodeci ecosa, and the seven spins are the seven symmetry axes of tetra cube as in the seven layers of heart muscle here from the Pettigrew dissections. So when you embed a tetra cube in, 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 inside of a dodeca, you get a structure like this, that they were actually, when, they, when the clairvoyants predicted subatomic physics years before it was known, by drawing that Anu, Psi Perception of Quarks is the title of the book after occult chemistry, they were actually drawing this. When they drew that Anu, the seven spins are the seven spin symmetry axes of the tetra cube, which are in the center. You see in a red almost there. <laughs> and the five spins are the dodeci costa symmetry axis. And so that perfect implosive slipknot is actually the model of non-destructive charge collapse which is literally proven in subatomic physics. The Anu uh, was three Anu per quark inside perception of quarks. And literally the symmetry of the heart of hydrogen, the heart of the human muscle structure, and what they saw at the heart of the sun. They saw that same perfect implosive slipknot. And that became the name of Anu Sun God, which happens to be the name of the father of the family of <laughs> Enki and Enlil, the returning. Why were they all about sun gods? <laughs> so uh, when Elena Denon interviewed Enki on his return, I recommend his book, her book, Cedars. Uh, he said, yes, he's bringing back the missing piece of the DNA recipe. Oh, and what did he call that? He said, the grail. <laughs> now, why do we need the grail in our blood? <laughs> why is that the recipe? Well, the chief science officer of Enki was called Thoth Hermes, whose symbol was the caduceus. Now, if we rotate that caduceus, we're going to see what happens during bliss in DNA. <laughs> and why is that the finishing part of the recipe here? You see, as, as we've discussed many times, that there are tens of thousands of intelligent humanoid civilizations in this galactic quadrant alone, and the chief ingredient of their relationship is trade. Actually, it's what holds the whole thing together. And what's the most valuable commodity? DNA. And what makes DNA valuable? If it implodes, ah, DNA that implodes is what allows your kids to lucid dream because that density of implosion and that recursive braid implosion in DNA 
is the wave mechanics of human bliss. And that's the geometry of the last slideshow here. Let me see if I'm going to try this one more time. So the last piece of the slideshow here, if we go to the other window, which is origin of negentropy. So we're going to be looking at how DNA braids recursively, literally embeds. And there's a long wave frequency signature that comes from your heart, <laughs> a long wave phonon geometry that measurably causes your DNA to braid implode. Here's that fractal hydrogen bond at the center of every DNA ladder rung. And here's the braid of the braid on the braid within the braid and your DNA is turning inside out. And this is actually a process of your DNA becoming toroidal, hint, Lord of the ring. <laughs> And that braiding process is measurably triggered by heart coherence. And, with, and that's turning inside out. And that creates this geometry at the heart, compassion, at the heart of DNA when you have access to human bliss. And what is that? That's a caduceus revolved. And that seems to look like a grail cup, doesn't it? So here is... Which has Anki Hermes. Sorry, but this is me narrating this 30 years ago. Embeds, a sleepy heart within heart, feminine reproductive organs <laughs> into that 3D fractal. You can zoom in forever and always see the same thing heart within heart, perfectly self contained, self embedded compassion. The grail. <laughs> so the, the point is that the science lesson here is that if we can teach our kids to have a bliss experience, cause their DNA to implode. This was called the origin of biologic negentropy, this ability to get centripetal, get fractal or get dead, as it said. And notice that in two dimensions, if you look at how phase conjugation happens among lasers, where negentropy was first measured, top center picture here, you actually get this view of the grail, which shows the swastika, which is actually how uh, the caduceus of Hermes is revolved into the grail. So, you know, Anki Hermes says he's coming back and he's bringing the grail with him, this magic recipe. And this is actually about non-destructive charge collide. So this is the science lesson of how you get a soul, which is how you implode and radiate coherent longitudinal interferometry. And this is actually the implosive uh, sort of storal to the mori of the ET politics, because... Well, this was the equation. This is Planck times integer exponents, golden ratio, predicting every negentropic force. Radii of hydrogen, the definition of sacred dimension, the British foot, the Schumann harmonics, the brainwave harmonics, LF component, HRV, Venus year, Earth year, galactic year, precessional year. Those time distances, times and distances, all predicted by Planck length or time times integer exponents, golden ratio, the definition of fractality also are the definition of the only path out of chaos. And that implosion is the origin of negentropy, the title of my book. And you'll see that at fractalfield.com. So that implosion is the science lesson. And the wave mechanics is exactly this caduceus right out of Hermes Thoth, who's the guy that returned with the nine, the cedar races, saying, oh, oh, we've got a key for you. If you could teach your children the hygiene to have bliss. <laughs> so <clears throat> what we're suggesting is that, um, you know, people who get caught up in the history story could spend many lifetimes trying to sort out, oh, I need to do be in judgment about who was the good guy and then who was the bad guy. Was Enki the good guy or was that Lil the bad? Is that mean, does that mean that Yahweh and Lil the father of the Jewish relation, they're all, you know, it was the largest plasma. Pairs, well, you know, that is not even the point. The point is that those who have an aura that are able to have a bliss process, that learn the discipline of the hygiene for charge attraction, the quality of grace. You know, the quality of grace is the curvature of your motion so that when you stop, you feel a tingle. That's the physics of yoga. That's a, a, a calculus of curvature of the quality of grace. That is a skill to make your hair stand up. 
you know, the Aboriginals <laughs> and the Italians actually agreed when we said, you know, the definition of culture is not the color of your wine or your shoe polish. No, the definition of culture is if you have the skill to teach your young people how to have a bliss experience. You know why that defines culture? Because it defines survival. Do you see? So in the West, according to the indigenous peoples, we have no culture until we know how to teach our young people to experience bliss. And this is the physics of what it is to be and to have a soul. And when we can teach that electrical engineering physics, and I mean electrical engineering physics to our universities and then to our governments, then governments could possibly make decisions which are not soulless. Soulless decisions like Wi-Fi and um, uh, electrosmog and uh, 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 the wrong material in, in the medical stabbings. These are all decisions that were made by people who do not know what a soul is. The person who put your child in an aluminum and steel school where their aura cannot grow, do not know what a soul is, and therefore could deprive your children of having one. So you see, this implosion triggered by heart coherence and brain coherence, recursive embedding, actually Glenn Ryan measured this at my suggestion, the density of the enzyme associated with the density of br recursive braiding in DNA measurably increases in the presence of heart coherence. That's the whole point of all the heart coherence literature. That's realheartcoherence.com. The point is that if your heart burns like a laser, that phonon cascade, which looks like a caduceus, hint Hermes, measurably, and I do mean measurably, causes your DNA to braid recursively and get centripetal, hint Lord of the Ring, turns inside out recursively. So the, the physics is that learning the skill to turn inside out recursively, it's like, um, our friend Jean Charles Moyen, you know, after he discovered that his lucid dreams were repeatedly turning into a bilocation portal experience, and his famous movie on that is called South Shore. And you'll see the measurements we made uh, with Jean Charles Moyen, the famous French secret space program experiencer, at flameandmind.com slash lucid brain. And just before his lucid dream became so coherent that he bilocated with witnesses and came back from the beach with sand between his toes and witnesses repeatedly bilocating just before his brain waves became massively coherent caduceus and you'll see the picture at flameandmind.com slash lucid brain of his brain wave measurements just the moment before he bilocated he saw in one eye where he was and in the other eye where he was going. <laughs> you know what that means? You see, when the kids see without their eyes, their eyes are closed or blindfolded, and they say, oh, tube, a vortex appeared inside my head and I could look through the center and that was the eyeball. Now we know the physics of the cause of perception. We know what you take with you when you die. You take with you that plasma tornado the medical surgeons who repeatedly came back from death experiences saying where they were looking at their body from outside their body were looking from the center of a plasma tornado. The coherence of that tornado of plasma imploding is key to the physics of what's called soul and knowing what it is to survive death and knowing what it is to inhabit a star. That's called embed ability. <laughs> you know, when in conventional physics, they talk about action at a distance, and they say it starts with something they call entanglement. And then they say you go down the Einstein-Rosen bridge, which is a wormhole, and you get action at a distance, something that Einstein only called spooky. But actually, what they don't know that entanglement perfected is the problem phase conjugation the caduceus solves. In other words, when you implode these vortex in a pine cone. The reason you get coherent action at a distance is because the leverage 
in that array. And that is the key to every single spiritual mystery, like lucid dreaming and you know healing people at a distance. When we teach healing at a distance to our plasma therapists at therify.net in 25 countries, we teach them to do healing at a distance, but we tell them it's not a mystery at all. It is simple physics that we know, for example, that when the centripetal force is generated between these two plasma pine cones, that the leverage on the array will increase if, if you do it at a magnetic line cross, sacred space, if you do it at sunrise or sunset, if you do it at equinox or solstice. See, these are the right-hand perpendicularities called four-wave mixing in phase conjugate physics, and they're called the sacred four directions in indigenous wisdom, but it's the same physics. So it's why when you do Agni Hotra, your hair stands up just before sunset when you light the plasma and a wave of fertility radiates. Well, this is a key. For example, when Karatkov measured cozy of mirrors doing military quality telepathy only at magnetic earth grid magnetic line crosses the only place cathedrals and labyrinths even therify works best so this is the dna radio these compression nodes of sacred space and that array in the earth grid looks like <laughs> so that's that's kind of the physics lesson that says if we can teach our children how to get coherent in lucid dreaming you know, another example is uh, th there's an old story in lucid dreaming is that if you look at your hand, you you're trying to wake up inside your dream. That's a wonderful metaphor, waking up inside a dream. But if you look at your hand inside a dream, well, how does that enable you to wake up inside the dream? I mean, is that a beautiful metaphor? Well, it turns out that the map of your hand's nervous connection on the folded surface of your brain is one of the biggest areas in that mapping. It's called the homunculus. So what you do when you look at your hand inside the brain is you densify the do loop, densify the do loop, <laughs> my initials D-E-W, do drop in. So, but if you densify the do loop, what you're doing is you're compressing and enabling the centripetal implosion of that vortex tornado. And that's enabling you to wake up inside the dream and know that you are dreaming and then you can steer. <laughs> so this business of getting dense because axes of spin symmetry are superposed sometimes by harmonic inclusiveness in frequency signature. For example, harmonic inclusiveness in heart rate variability is the most powerful way to measure immune health in the medical literature. That harmonic inclusiveness is perfected in what is called fractality because that's implosive embedding. And that harmonic inclusiveness perfected is golden ratio by definition because that is the ratio between wavelengths which can best non-destructively interfere or implode or compress. And that's why gravity exists. And that's why life exists. That's why mind exists. That's why perception exists. And that's why the ability to inhabit stars exists because of that implosive centripetal force. Visualize the top-down view of a pine cone or a rose. <laughs> you know, we told this story every time. <laughs> when it, it, We've told this story so many times. Maybe it, it bores you. But when they teach the kids in the Steiner School, first they draw the rose with intense pre precision. Very accurately. And you know, if, you're, if your kids watch too much TV before the age of seven, they lose the inner muscle to make a picture inside their head. And that's the physics of all creation lost. Oops, oops. <laughs> so here are the Steiner schools and they've watched a few less, you know, they, the kids aren't addicted to their TV screens yet, hopefully before the age of seven. It's really because they lose the inner muscle to make a picture inside. So then they're making a picture inside their head by drawing this beautiful pencil picture of a rose. So now they've drawn this rose with great intensity. Now close your eyes, kids, and visualize a rose. Now, they know the kids have done their homework 
in the classroom if at that moment the classroom fills with the smell of roses. <laughs> now we teach the physics, and I do mean the physics of why, because the flowering brain implosively generates an infrared sweetness, which is the physics of olfaction, that infrared radiance. It's why I saw the hummingbird smash in the windows when the lady were having bliss inside the sealed house, because they smelled that bliss, the infrared went through the window. <laughs> That's called the flowering brain. So the room fills with the smell of roses when the kids properly visualize the rose. <laughs> and that is actually the nectar. And that's a beginning to understand the physics of bliss itself. That's when you taste that dripping sweetness at the back of the mouth. And when the low frequencies, the same low frequencies that drive the therify, drive the sacrocranial pump wave up the spine liquid pump, if your spine liquid is pumping, it's clinically impossible to be depressed. <laughs> and that's the snake charmer that comes from the amygdala, the snake brain's mouth, into the bird brain. And the serpent feeds the eagle and Quetzalcoatl returns. And guess what? Quetzalcoatl just returned. Ain't it cool? They called it kinik ahau in, in, the, in the Mayan literature and, and in the Busegi Mountain, uh, uh, Peter Moon's books, they call it Tinnik, ahau, and they realize, oh, that means Quetzalcoatl. Oh, that means Viracocha. Oh, that means Hermes. Oh, that means Thoth. Oh, that's the same Thoth who's the name of Atlantis. This is the same Thoth, Thothmosis, who's the name of the royal lineage of Egypt. It's the same Thoth who's the name of the father of Magdalene. It's the same Thoth who invented the Caduceus, the symbol of life force, and he's back. <laughs> and what did he come back to do? He came back with a science lesson. The science lesson is that if we can immortalize our blood by learning charge attraction, implosion, we can get leverage first on the short wave, our environment, we can make rain, do all the fun stuff. Read about the goldenmean.info slash rain, our rain making workaround. I learned after I had a a fainting swoon experience in the gold sarcophagus of Tutankhamun in Cairo that they were using his blood for rainmaking because every pharaoh knew that you get fired if you can't make the Nile flood on time. And after several hundred generations, <laughs> the children inheriting the yearning at the moment of death of their grandparents, the wilt mutation of the species Tutankhamun, in this case, was a rainmaker. <laughs> and I had a little fragment of that life memory. I learned when rolling thunder was making rain, he was ticking, tickling the belly of a certain black beetle, which we now learned that the nervous wiring in that belly was profoundly fractal, the same black beetle scarab that was sacred to Tutankhamun and the Egyptians. When uh, Elizabeth Hayes' little boy looks up from staring at the black beetle, saying, I just remembered my past lives. Uh, there was the perfect fractal electric vortex. And tickling that black beetle's belly was Rolling Thunder's technique for rainmaking. I actually use pine cones sometimes. But you get the idea, actually, when you do a, a labyrinth, you, you do that same implosive capacitive cascade making. So that was an important memory, that fragment of soul memory of the Tutankhamun story. And many people have fragments of those memories. When I learned the actual physics of consciousness when most children if they're reasonably grounded and know how to have bliss they're standing in a mud puddle is good <laughs> if they look up at a cloud and focus their attention they can put a hole in that cloud the physics is because their attention is electrically centripetal and that is the physics of precipitation what capacitive implosion teaches water vapor to share and become a droplet. That is called the physics of Christos, the crystallization. It's literally the Christ principle, as in Trevor Constable's weather engineering on the high seas, the perfect orgone. It was an implosive 60 degree cone capacitor that was the best rainmaker. <laughs> so once you learn the physics of what Christ, I mean, Thoth, I mean, they were all trying to teach us implosion because. It's the only path out of chaos. It's the only way to empower DNA. It's the only way to generate children with the soul. So you see, 
I think we need to grow a little bit past our idea that humans were humans and the gods were gods. Whenever we talked about gods, we were just talking about people who were embedding larger plasma arrays. And we thought it was so cool that, you know, Moses saw this cloud and, you know, that I, in the mercy seat between the fractal capacitor, the Ark of the Covenant with the angel's gold wings, there was an arc. I mean, an electric arc. And that capacitor was implosive enough to reduce radioactivity. Actually, that's what it was built for by the Syrians because the dumb Anunnaki required nukes to get the, through the Van Allen belt at that time. But that implosive capacitor was called the mercy seat because who could inhabit the larger array? They called the hygiene to handle the high voltage. They call it uh, the plague of Azoth, which turned out to be also the plague of Azoth means nitrogen, which the Draco the, would breathe. But also the plague of Azoth was a name for radiation poisoning. And it's so sad that our physicists today don't actually have a clue why implosive capacitance reduces radioactivity measurably. It's critical. I was there when TEPCO in Japan phoned Keshe and said, yep, this nanomaterial reduces radioactivity. And nobody's even teaching the physics. Even after um, Bruce Cathy measured that nuclear critical mass is dramatically reduced at earth grid magnetic cross points. You know, is this a threat to national security? Oh, well, I guess, yeah. But guess what? The same earth grid magnetic cross points cause sacred space, cause telepathy, and cause consciousness. Hello. So the nature of consciousness, a threat to national security? I suppose focused human attention reduces radioactivity. Yuri Geller made that measurement. Just like earth grid magnetic cross nodes reduce critical mass measurably. So centripetal force is the key to the principle that connects the sacred space of the earth grid ley lines where telepathy was enabled and where longitudinal wave nodes embed in that fractal array. So I've carried on here, but you get the, you get the idea that if we empower ourselves by learning a few basic principles, if you for yourself personally could visualize how one water vortex got centripetal. Remember, you have a stack from the hydrogen radii to the water radii to the vortex radii. It's all piezoelectric. In that stack, the charge is imploding through a cascade at the to the tuned to the focal point, which is the Planck threshold. And out that pine cone squirt gun at the center comes a longitudinal array sometimes called a gravity wave, sometimes called heaven, sometimes called the rainbow light body, sometimes called the vril. It's actually a longitudinal EMF coherence array. If you can visualize what made one vortex centripetal, you could know, unlike Einstein, Stephen Hawking's and NASA, you could know why an object falls to the ground. And then you could know the cause of consciousness, the cause of perception, the cause of life and what Enki meant when he, when he said he's coming back with the grail, you could know the cause of human bliss, which could ignite the blood into what's called fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood. So there's this slideshow will be at um, a goldenmean.info slash PowerPoint. And uh, all of these slideshows are at fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood. But if you could actually accurately visualize for yourself why that perfect rose pine cone fractal implosive vortex visualize how the wave mechanics by golden ratio down that cone are causing that to become centripetal do that vision accurately you'll be like those steiner kids visualizing a rose and then suddenly you'll begin to feel the meaning of all centripetal forces the grail in the blood the only path out of chaos. And that pure principle will then enable you to understand the Lord of the Ring, why vortex ball lightning responds to telepathy, how you inhabit the heart of the sun. It's all the same principle. You get centripetal or you get dead. <laughs> so actually the corollary is get fractal or get dead. <laughs> so that was the happily ever after here. You know, you can reach me at fractalfield.com 
info at fractalfield.com. I'm very available to you. And we're happy to become a shareable wave. <laughs> so. Dan, you are, I had no idea my mind was about to be blown. I had no idea. You know what I feel like you did, Dan? You gave everyone here an opportunity to uh, turn on more strands of our DNA. I, I felt something happening in me. You know, I, I don't want to say I go around saying I'm stupid or anything like that. I don't think I'm stupid. I have a very smart heart. I have um, huge emotional intelligence. But you helped me connect so many dots. There, there were, I, I was taking pages of notes. I couldn't write fast enough. And then I was trying to help everybody get all your websites in there because you were taking us to certain pages that were important. Um, the world needs this information now, Dan. And I am so grateful to you that you are providing it. Uh, I think it was Katie, Katie, someone in the chat. I don't know if you're able to go back and look at the chat, but the chat was going off because people were like, so grateful, you know, for all the websites you were throwing out there. Everybody's mind has been blown. Our hearts are blown open. I um, you, Michelle, I told you. Please. Oh my gosh. Alan, yeah. you, you, yeah. you know what? I was thinking, I was so nervous, Dan, because <laughs> Alan does such a great job of, of, um, introing people. He's, he's just the best at introing. And when they asked me to introduce you, it was because Alan was busy. And I'm like, Alan, how am I going to do justice, justice to Dan? I mean, he, he's like a genius. <laughs> and Alan's like, you'll do fine. <laughs> and I'm all, how well, if, if you him? felt it in your blood, that's good. That is the point, really. I that, absolutely that's felt chart. it in my blood. And, you know, when I met James Gilliland, um, Alan, you were there when I met James Gilliland and he put me on his radio show that night. And I didn't know why, because I'm not a woman that has a website or any of that kind of stuff. I didn't have a radio show back then. I, I just considered myself a housewife that wanted to understand about orbs. And I bawled at his presentation when he was showing and talking about things. And then we became friends. And he said, let me put you on my, my radio show tonight because I told him I heard a voice in my head telling me to do a um, bring a group to Mount Shasta during WESOC. And this was in 2007. But when I met James, it was 2008. And James overheard me telling that to someone. And he said, Michelle, that's God talking to you that, you know, I'll help you. I'll put you on my radio show tonight. There was no Facebook back then. I was like, I didn't, you know. I emailed an email that said I was going to do this. I didn't even know. I, I wasn't somebody that knew how to put anything like that together. And he introduced me that night on his radio show. I think he said, Michelle Anderson is an incarnate Pleiadian spreading bliss energy on the planet. And I was <laughs> like, what the heck? I, I had no idea what he was talking about, but I do know that passion is infectious and your passion and your heart and the way that you brought this to life for all of us i know that it had a rippling effect because the chat was going off my my heart my blood i was feeling all of it and i've had such there was one thing that i didn't write down that i wanted you to to relay again you talked about your favorite book on NK in a, in, in, and in Lil, and it was written by who? Yes, Anton Park. You know, I had Kundalini, and then I wrote a book on Enki, goldenmean.info slash Enki, and then Sitchin wrote a book on Enki, and then Anton Parks had Kundalini and wrote a book on Enki. Uh, it, it's called uh, The Secret of the Dark Stars. The Secret of the Dark Stars is the, the black hole you generate when you have bliss. But you can read all about that at fractalfield.com slash Zeitlin. I'm putting the link in the chat window where I have that whole Dan, history. It's so good, Dan, yeah. it's so good that you are keeping up the work. I mean, now I can follow about three or four sentences into the lecture. I mean, I, <laughs> there's a lot of lectures on my YouTube and Neil's YouTube with Dan and there's such a vast uh, expansion of the mind to understand the fractal field implosion and all the things you, you're talking about for you and, and make it practical because it's not just philosophy. Dan has actually 
put these devices together. Yeah, the Therify, the Flame in Mind, the Imploder is all based on exactly that principle. And, you know, Elena Denon's book, The Cedars, is basically the return of Anki Thoth. And so that is I, a I, climax to this story of the, the ultimate star being. <laughs> I, I was feeling so much that. And I tried to put each one of, every time you threw out a website, I was trying to keep up and put it in. Um, and I was screenshotting some of your presentation because my radio partner as alan knows my podcast partner eric rankin this is a lot of stuff that lights him up too and you should get eric and dan together to talk about the um, sonic nature of geometric forms and your whole thing about the two standing columns uh and that um you know i just discovered that the new yorker hotel where tesla generated the um, that whole field that it was creating is directly in line with the Empire State Building. Do you think there's these? Yeah, two he had it on an array. You know, Tesla was close. Pire wireless power without wires. Um, he was close, but didn't get the frequency signature right. And he actually didn't understand the node. If you saw those light bulbs in the lawn, he was trying to light up at a distance. They actually had to be on a longitudinal array. And the frequency signature, you know, 60 cycle is actually wrong. 50 hertz is perfect because it's the golden ratio to Planck. So there's a whole frequency signature and geometry required for action at a distance and global wireless power, which incidentally, the pyramids are precisely correct. And we, we have a whole film on exactly how the pyramids were literally global wireless power. The, the infrasound of the pyramids, the phase conjugate pump wave was the Schumann harmonics. Wow, we got to get you and Eric together because Eric, sure. I think, is a genius too with sound and geometry and wave harmonics and all the things. And Dan, Dan, you're looking really good these days. Uh, well, I had a haircut for you today because I was changing from my uh, Jesus look to my Saint Germain look and then back. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, you, you lit us all up, Dan. And I thank you so much. I'm so glad I got to be your host. I feel really privileged and honored to meet you. And I hope you'll come on Awakening Code Radio with Eric Rankin and I so that we can dive deeper. I mean, you just, you, you lit me up. I, if I was tired before, I, I'm not anymore. I just. Well, this was fun. I'm very flexible. I, I'm a shareable wave. By the way, I put the link for our implosion sound article, fractalfield.com slash implosion sound. I put the link there. So you all good, guys. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you. Also, the beautiful place you're living in, Dan, in the Pyrenees with the fresh water and clean air. And you're getting, are you connecting with any ETs out there? Are you are they <laughs> You know, I had some telepathic with Phaseus, the mystic of the Andromedan, uh, about a year or two ago. And that has plugged into where we are now, actually, with Elena Denot. So, yeah. Wow. I'm very and lucky. I'm grateful. About the Pluto Aquarius alignment in January 2023. It's coming. That. Yep. And uh, I got a T square on the midheaven in my astrology. So, you know, with Pluto in there. So, I'm sure there's heavy karma. So, what song are you? Are you. Uh... Scorpio? Uh, double Scorpio. Yeah. <laughs> Look out. Of course, the Kundalini is going to activate you early. That was, his, that was his, the Kundalini, Michelle, is what got Dan launched into it's true. space. It's true. Yeah, we don't apologize for Sting. We enjoy it. Yeah, right. <laughs> My Kundalini experience happened inside the pyramid dedicated to ISIS in Mount Shasta. Wow. And it was a public thing that embarrassed me because of how it happened. And right. I didn't understand it. I had no idea what was going on. It was, it was quite something. But that's now that I've talked to a lot of people that have had these experiences, I understand what it was. But who boy, that was something else. And it was during, I think it was during a solar eclipse or something. Yeah, so mine, everything, was, the, mine yeah. was in the Gurdjieff school and, and in the Great Pyramid. We made a documentary in the biophysics of Kundalini. I put the link in there, goldenmean.info slash Kundalini. Okay, because we're doing some Kundalini panels uh, here on Portal to Ascension. We just did one, but you know, I know Kundalini is what activated you and it's what activating all of us now. Exactly. Because I think the um, movement into Aquarius is about the Kundalini and the Iranian energy going up the spine of the higher levels of DNA, right? Exactly. That, that wave mechanics, we worked out in detail. It's all there. But I think we should let Geraldine come on now. I see her. Oh, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. And 
I just thank you so much, Dan. And Alan, will you stay and help introduce Geraldine? Hi, Geraldine. Geraldine. Love you, dear. Dan. Blessings. Blessings. Dan, so good to see you. See Incredible you. Incredible as always. Thank you. So we had fun. Comments, Blessings. Geraldine, on, on, uh, on Dan's uh, fractal wave. Giving oh, things. you cannot say anything. That's just, it's its there for itself. It's been- Geraldine's wonderful. We have to <laughs> absorb you. that information and body it and practice it. So thank exactly. you, Exactly. And Geraldine's probably more grounded than me, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, no thanks, way. Dan. You're Bye -bye. doing amazing work. <laughs> yeah, and you, Michelle, isn't, isn't he pretty, like, uh, fantastic out of this world? Yes, I had no idea what I what was in store for me with that. And I'm glad I was able to stay and listen to the whole thing and take notes because, you know, as you know, Alan, with five days of all of this, we still have lives to, you know, there's still things that has to get done. So I haven't been able to sit and watch every single mm -hmm. presentation. But I think one of one of the one of the people wrote in the chat that they're they've never been more grateful for the access to the replay and i feel the same way he he got a lot of information in in a sh in a short amount of time 